Welcome everyone to the grand opening of the new Mike's Master Classes website and the second in our series of live Q&A webinars. <clears throat> um, I'm, this is very exciting. Steve has been with Mike's Master Classes since the beginning in 2006, as well as some of you attending tonight. Thank you. I also want to thank Jeremy Ohms, who has developed a new site, and we'll go over some of the new features and benefits after the Q&A session. So I'll turn it over to Steve now. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, really appreciate it. It's um, been great working with Mike's master classes, and I'm um, very excited about the new site. And um, I thought I would just play a little something to start. <laughs> So that was a little tune called I Surrender Dear. Um, that was written by Harry Barris. Gotta love the name Harry Barris, right? For all our uh, Barry Harris fans. Um, so um, 
Yeah, it's just a tune that I just started playing. Um, you can go back and listen to the Charlie Christian version of that tune. And uh, some more jazz guitar history. Uh, Tony uh, Rizzi uh, did a uh, album with the five guitars and rhythm section, and they do I Surrender Deer on that. They retitled it, I believe. Um, anyhow, um, somebody saying no sound. Um, some people have no sound. Others have sound. Okay. So are we good? You hear me? Okay, great. I'm um, going to answer a question that we got um, a few days ago. Um, so a uh, question here is, if I'm going to be doing a Baroque class, um, this person says, um, there's no name, by the way. It's, I've enjoyed Steve Herberman's Baroque class, and I'd love more of the same. Well, I really enjoyed doing that class. And... Um, I've got another one coming out soon, um, which is going to be um, Baroque Part 2. Uh, it's not going to be the title, but um, uh, if you'll remember in the first class, uh, it was two-part counterpoint, uh, mostly um, cadences like 5-1, um, 5-2, uh, of 5-3, five of five of things like that. Um, and what I'm going to be doing for the next Baroque class is uh, going to be three part, three voices instead of two. Um, so um, I'm pretty excited about the class and it's going to be a pretty long class too, pretty in depth. Um, so yes, that's, that's a question there. Um, let me go down uh, and answer another question. Um, okay. Um, what are the newest musical concepts for you personally that you are working on? Mark asks that question. Um, well, what I've been doing lately is a lot of things, uh, sort of um, researching topics for my new master classes. So when I did the, um, the class on tents, fun with tents, um, I was exploring that and working with that. Um, and then uh, the, the latest class, upper pedals, um, you know, obviously I was working with, with a lot of upper pedals. And so I kind of, a lot of times practice what, um, my latest masterclass topic is just to, um, be, be a little bit more prepared and, um, uh, sort of have a fresh take on it. Okay. Um, aside from that, uh, I'm working on things for my gigs. Um, so if, um, let's say the vocalist that I'm working with, Alina Cycli, um, sends me a new tune. She says, I want to do this tune. I'll be working on that. Um, also, I'll work on soloing concepts um, in a uh, guitar voice duo situation, um, which is basically like solo guitar, just working, working out solo uh, techniques. Uh, more on that later. Let's see if I can uh, find a, um, a, a question from somebody here live. Feel free to, to ask a question. I'm seeing a lot of hellos, and that's that's awesome. That's great. Um, okay. Hey, Pat. Uh, Pat from L.A. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to go uh, down to another question, but feel free to um, to type one in if you have one um, to get to get you all involved as well. Okay. Um, Guy, actually, I think um, this is from um, Guy, one of our first um, Mike's Masterclass purchasers. Um, and he asks, um, he has a technical question dealing with octaves. Can you demonstrate your right and left hand method for playing octaves? And if you have time, integrate integrating single lines with octaves like Wes. Well, nobody can touch Wes, but, you know, I'll give it my best shot. What can I say? All right. So um, basically what I do with the right hand is um, I, I definitely don't want to use a pick or my fingernails or anything like that. So I'll just use my thumb like Wes did. Mm -hmm. And um, usually what I do is I anchor the hand um, on the pick guard like Wes did mm -hmm. um, here. The fingers, it just feels like uh, very comfortable to do that for me. And then um, I, I'll use Wes's technique um, w w that he does a third string and first string, uh, one and four, uh, fourth string and second string, one and four. Um, 
fifth and third, one and three, six and four, one and three. And every once in a while, I might play an octave like this, like on the first string and the fourth string. But most of the time, I only like to keep one string in between. So that's less muting that I would have to do, you know? So. And a really great thing about trying to get a West sound would be sliding a lot with your left hand. Um, and then Guy asks about integrating single notes. Sometimes it sounds great to do an octave thing um, in one register and answer it with single notes in the other. So if I'm doing, let's say I'm in A minor. This type of thing. Um, so I, there's nothing really special that I'm doing. It's just uh, stuff that Wes did back in the 50s and 60s, you know. Um, but thanks for the question. It was a good question. Um, and I do use octaves, um, um, not so much in solo guitar, but um, a lot of times uh, if I'm playing with a group, I, I'll, I like to use octaves. Um, so let me just scroll down and see there's there's a, a lot of people piping in. It's um, a lot of friends, great to have you all here. Um, David from Maryland, I know who you are, David, Southern Maryland. Um, okay, um, let's see, Israel, um, I play by ear. Can you recommend the fastest way to play jazz solos? Um, yeah, you know, playing by ear is um, a beautiful thing. I love that idea. And I wish more people would would um, play what they hear as opposed to letting the guitar play uh, the music, you know, letting the fingers do the walking, so to speak. Um, so my advice would be to do as much singing as you can. And I'm going to roll this into a question on ear training that I had uh, by Steve W. down here. I hope Steve's tuning in. Um, and um, yeah, so. Um, I would say just work on singing as much as possible. Sing your favorite jazz solos. Lee Konitz would have all his students, before they did anything else, sing Louis Armstrong solos. That, that was the assignment. You had to sing. He would assign you a solo, and um, you would sing it before you even played it on your instrument, and then you would play it on your instrument. So I would say sing along to solos. Um, don't worry about learning a bunch of solos. Just focus on on one at a time. Um, so maybe since you're a guitar player, maybe you really like to do a Wes Montgomery solo or a Jim Hall solo or a Kenny Burrell solo or somebody like that. I would say the easiest um, person to probably sing along to would be Miles on some of the, the cool jazz stuff that he did, which where he left a lot of space. So I would sing along to that. Um, now, the question from Steve W., uh, what, what do you recommend for ear training to improve pitch and chord ear recognition? Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of great apps that you can get for your phone that um, has um, intervals that you recognize um, intervals and, you know, it tells you whether you're right or wrong. So you can drill on intervals and then use that as a test, test yourself with these ear training apps. There's too many of them to name. Um, in fact, the app that I was using for a while seemed to disappear, and I thought it was it was a good one. Um, and um, so they they come and go, I suppose. Um, but um, as far as improving pitch, it's a good idea to get a um, chromatic tuner and sing along. Uh, I mean, sing and check your your intonation. Um, you know, Dr. Zlotnick, um, I think Mike Geller might have studied with Dr. Zlotnick. I could be wrong. I bet you anything there's somebody out there that's listening right now studied with Dr. Zlotnick, um, who was a teacher, an ear training guru um, that uh, one one time was out at the University of Maryland. He had this exercise. I'm going to um, he called it pivot ear training. I'll show it to you really quickly. Um, he would start on an F and he would say, sing a major triad. One, three, five, three, one. So you go. Okay. Then 
you take this one and that becomes three. And you go three, one, three, five, three. And I'm in sixth position right there. And I did a D flat major triad. I did F, D flat, F, A flat, F. Okay. Then I take the same F. Um, so I'm beginning and ending always with an F. I went one, three, five, three, one. And then I went three, one, three, five, three. And now I'm going to go, I'm going to make this the five. So what's that the five of? And of course, right now we're only doing major triads um, because this could be the fifth of B flat major or B flat minor or certain augmented and diminished. But we're just going to do major triads. I should have said that at first. So we're going to go, um, it's going to be five, three, one, three, five, like that. And you test yourself. Um, basically, you can play along at first till you learn that. And it's a really good thing to sort of trick your ear a little bit because um, the F and the D flat are, are, it's not diatonic. D flat major is not diatonic to F. So it's, it's good. It um, helps uh, with your ears. Uh, Mike Geller uh, piped in. He says, uh, no, he, he worked with Larry Wooldridge. Maybe Larry Wooldridge, um, who was kind of a famous teacher in the Baltimore area, he might have also done the pivot ear training. Another guy that teaches pivot ear training is Paul Ballenbeck, who's with Mike's master classes. So if you really want to get in depth with ear training, uh, he'd be a great guy to study with. Um, although I incorporate some of that in my own teaching. Um, I like to get students to sing things as much as possible. Um, in fact, when you're soloing, it's really great to sing along to uh, your soloing um, because you're going to be phrasing much better that way and not let the instrument um, dictate the phrasing. You, you know, you want to take breaths every once in a while and um, phrasing is, is, is of big importance uh, to me. Um, okay, I'm going to go to another question here just because there's a lot of questions. There's not a lot of time, so I'm going to kind of move through it. Um, Trevor C. Um, asked the question, do you do any particular method for memorizing and retaining songs? Uh, yes, the first thing that I do when I learn a tune is I listen to it repeatedly and I listen to many different versions of the tune. Uh, preferably, um, you know, I'll put it on like an iPod or something and listen, listen to it in my car just so I can hear it a lot. Then, um, this is even before I go to a fake book, so I already know what the melody is, so I can sing the melody of the tune and everything. Then what I try to do is sit down with a guitar and play the melody, um, again, without looking at a book. Uh, this is the way Kenny Burrell said he learned also. He said he learned all his uh, standards uh, off of the radio. And while I'm on Kenny Burrell, I'll, I'll tell you also that uh, Kenny mentioned that uh, when he would be with Dizzy, when he first started out, um, and, uh, he would show Dizzy, you know, he'd play certain standards and Dizzy would say, oh, no, those aren't the right chords, you know. So Kenny would guess at the chords um, and he liked some of the chords, but Dizzy didn't always like some of his chords. Uh, that's what the story is anyways. Um, so it's, it's kind of nice to be able to also, when you're listening to these tunes, to try to figure out as much of the chord changes as you can when you're listening. Um, so when you get to your instrument and you play the melody, um, you can try to put chords to it. And, and then what I would do, Trevor, is, um, is I would play just the, once you figure out what the chords are, and you can consult a book at this point, if, if you'd like, or, or a variety of books. I think the best book for standard, um, standard tunes would be the Dick Hyman fake books, and there's two of them. One, one is called A Hundred Tunes Every Professional Musician Should Know, um, and it's by E.K. Publishing, E-K-A-Y, uh, which I'm not sure if they're in print anymore, but you should be able to still get the book somehow. Um, hundred professional, A Hundred Tunes Every Professional Musician Should Know is the first one, probably came out in the early, uh, mid-80s, maybe, 83, 84, I want to guess. Um, Bill Levitt had that book. Um, so that he, he told me, you got to get this book uh, when I was a student of his at Berkeley in 1985. Um, and um, then the other book's called All the Right Changes. Go check that out. All the Right Changes. It's another batch of 100 tunes where he has substitute um, chords written in red above the regular black chord changes. So you get to see what um, all the, the hip substitutions are. Um, 
but you can really trust these books um, that he's he's consulted the original music and he makes little changes and he tells you what the changes are in red. Um, aside from that, I would say um, Trevor's also asking about, you know, memorizing and retaining the songs. I just think you have to play the songs a lot and uh, play them with people, play them by yourself, um, work out a chord melody version to a tune and be careful not to just know a chord melody version. If you work out a chord melody version, and that's the only thing you can play, then somebody's going to ask you to play the melody and you're not going to be able to do it without the chord, you know? Um, so you want to be able to separate the chords from the melody and play chord melody. Um, as far as retention, um, I would say just, again, listening analytically, like the story of Wes Montgomery going to the movies with his family. And they would say at the end of the movie, hey, how was the movie? He'd say, I was listening to the music. I was analyzing the music. You know, that's that's what he was doing. Um, there was another guy that asked a question here um, about the, um, this kind of rolls into this other question, and then I'm going to get to some of the live questions. So excuse me here. Um, Mag Magat or Maget D. I um, believe he's from South Africa. He has a question. Hi, Steve. Just two questions. A lot of jazz students don't want or afraid, they're afraid to ask. Number one, is there a shortcut to becoming a good jazz guitarist? Uh, no, I don't, I don't think there is a shortcut to becoming a good jazz guitarist. Uh, the, only, the only shortcut might be um, to study music theory and work on ear training, but that's certainly not a shortcut. That's gonna, gonna take you some time. So I, I don't really believe in the shortcuts myself. Um, then he writes, Wes, Joe Pass, Grant Green, Herb Ellis, Jimmy Rainey. Um, they uh, always oh, he's, he's saying why do all the masters um we are learning from all sound the same um i you know i don't think he means that they sound the same i th i think what uh magat is um getting at here um is that and he says they never attended a jazz institute is that they they learn by ear and why do they all sound the same because i think um they have a lot of the same influences these guys listen to horn players um, Charlie Parker, Lester Young, uh, piano players and things, and they were just influenced by them. And, and these guys were all ear players. Um, they all primarily learn, learn from ear by ear. And that's something that I think is going away a little bit with the jazz institutions, all the colleges and the online courses. And I'm, I'm not knocking them. I think they're great. That's what we do here. Right. But, um, definitely devote a lot of time to working on your ear and ear training and singing. Um, you should be singing all the time. Um, and, and yeah, that's it. Okay. So let me, let me see a, a question here. Um, yeah. Thanks everybody for um, asking all the questions. I'm just leaning in my computer's kind of, kind of way off in the distance here. Um, okay. Uh, Joel or Joel um, says, how do you navigate the fingerboard with descending two five ones? How high the moon Cherokee descending two five ones. All right. So let's see how high the moon. Um, this is the new one F F minor. I'll turn my volume up a little bit. So, you know, to me, it doesn't matter that it's descending. Um, you can work on two fives and learn two five one lines. Um, and, you know, they can be ascending. You could be doing an ascending two five one. I'm going to do G minor nine. I'm in eighth position here. G minor nine to C 13. Then I'll do A flat minor nine to D flat 13 to A minor nine to D 13. Okay. And I'll just play, let's see, maybe each one for a bar, like two, three, four. So, you know, these are all like little modular two, five, one lines that, that I've learned. Um, that sounds similar to, to the sample question somebody asked me um, about what are my favorite two, five, one licks. Um, and I think, um, I think, Joel, I don't know if you saw, saw my answer to that. You're sort of asking it in a, in a different way here, which I appreciate. You're giving me sort of specific tunes. 
Um, with Cherokee, you're probably talking about the bridge, right? Like where it's going. are kind of like bebop lines that that i've learned um so i again you know they don't have to be going um in a cycle four pattern like that like c sharp f sharp b b e a or anything they can be going in any direction i i would learn um two five two five licks and two five one licks um there's a, a good book out there actually that um somebody transcribed um five guitar players um tal farlow jimmy rainey pat martino um and uh, uh so on a couple other guys um that uh, i'm forgetting but anyways he transcribed a bunch of two five one licks um but you know what i would say it's even better to do it yourself if you can transcribe them yourself um and then i would say also to just make sure the phrasing has space, you know, and, and that you don't start all your lines like on the beat, especially on beat one. So if you're going to create your own lines, um, start on the um, start in the end of four, start on the end of one, start on beat two, start in different parts of the phrase. I, th I think that's a, a beautiful thing to to try to do. OK, so I'm going to move move it on, move on here. Um, uh, let's see. Any advice? This is from Antonio. Uh, Antonio M. Any advice on sight reading changes or soloing over changes you haven't yet internalized? Um, yeah. Um, sight reading changes. Um, well, I suppose that you 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 just mean maybe playing changes off of a chord chart. Um, my advice would be uh, to do it the easiest way possible since it's sight reading. So let's say if you want to, you know, you're doing, we'll go back to the two fives. You have D minor seven to G seven, and then it goes F minor seven to B flat seven or something. You could do it in a hip way and go D minor seven, G seven, and then go like F minor seven to, you know, more of like a voice led kind of way. But I would say just go with what's easiest if you're sight reading it. You know, you can't stumble. You 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 want to be you don't want to mess anybody up. Um, the second part of your question, Antonio, is um, uh, let's see, any advice on uh, reading or soloing? Sorry, over changes you haven't yet internalized. Yes, um, what I do, and I think a lot of the older school players did this, and this this gets back to to the question from uh, Magat in South Africa, also because. Um, all these players he mentioned basically use the caged method or some form of the caged method. Um, and if I am having to solo over changes I've never thought about, I first think of the chord form. And, and that gives me a, a sort of a, uh, a place on the guitar that I can play. So if I see C major 7 sharp 11, I go up to here, let's say, to, to the um, one most guitar players would go to in seventh position and play this voicing okay and then um i um would just play within that shape that that chord shape so i'd play the lydian scale you know now you notice there i'm, I'm arpeggiating i'm going I'm not only trying to play um, scales. Um, when I first went to Berkeley and I studied with uh, Al Dufino, uh, he was great. Uh, he, uh, when he soloed, it was never just scales or never arpeggios. It seemed to always be some kind of blend, and I was very fascinated with that, and so I got into that. Um, anyway, so not to get off on a tangent there, but um, when I'm sight reading changes, I, I, I look to the chord. If it says, um, you know, um, a flat nine and I was playing first C major seven sharp 11 and then something like a flat nine which is a bit unrelated and it's a flat six to that other chord I would then um, I'll go 
mm -hmm. I'm playing in that position. And I've, so mm -hmm. I've got some notes um, as, as guides. Um, you know, I have mm -hmm. like five notes mm -hmm. in that chord that, so I already know five notes of the scale. Now it doesn't sound right to do this. You don't want to be one of those guys that solos like that all the time. So you got to learn the scale. I'll go back to like what Joe Pat said. I'm sure uh, Pat uh, from LA, uh, who's maybe not in LA anymore, but he studied out at GIT, Pat Carmody. Um, um, I know he talks, um, you know, a lot about Joe Pass because he learned from Joe when, when he came out there. Joe would say, um, basically learn the scale and the arpeggio right within the chord shape. Um, so if you're playing this chord, A flat 13, and you're in 10th position, and I'm on the, that is an F up here, a high F on the 13th fret. Um, then learn the scale that, that is appropriate for that chord. And that would be an A flat Lydian in most cases. So then he would say, learn it from the highest note of the chord to the lowest. So you go. And then the funny thing is, is Joe would say, well, that's not even a scale. It's not even a scale, but it is a scale, right? But to him, because it's not starting on the root, you're not going. You're starting from another note. It's the, it's a mode of the scale. Okay, like that. Okay, so so um, you know that maybe even that might answer somebody else's question about how to conceive. I know there was another question on here about um, what are some of my soloing strategies, um, and um, let me answer that question a little bit more because I really like that question, um, although it's a bit vague. Um, what are some of my soloing strategies? Well, one of them is that I solo around chord shapes. You know, Herb Ellis has a, a book out about soloing off of chord shapes. Um, the name, I'm sorry, I, I think it's called All the Shapes You Are, I believe, something like that. Probably has all the things you are in there, right? Um, now, um, some other strategies that I like to do are guide tone lines. Anybody who has studied with me privately will know that um, I won't shut up about guide tone lines. I, I think they're a tremendous thing. So uh, let's say I'm doing um, rhythm changes um, in B flat. Um, so I might think of this, this as a guide tone line. I'm going to start on an A, which is the major seventh of B flat, or it's the fifth of D minor seven. So I'm going to be going, listen, I'm just going to be playing a half uh, step chromatic line descending, and I'm going to pl actually play the chords. I'm going to go... Keep going. Uh, maybe go um, common tone. Yeah, we'll go up now. I'll go. Maybe keep going up chromatically, uh, and then substitutions. That's one of the best exercises ever uh, to do, and you do it in chords. Okay, um, Lenny Bro. Um, talked about this a lot. I never got a chance to study with him privately, but I have quite a few um, lessons that he did, um, you know, kind of collected these cassette tapes and listened to the way he taught. Uh, he loved this chromatic line exercise. It's like a directional um, approach where he would, uh, you know, you start from any note, really. Um, in fact, you could start on a weird note, like an F sharp. That F sharp, now you need a, a, a substitution. You can't start on B flat, unless you do B flat major seven sharp five. Sure, why not? You can go. It's actually pretty nice, isn't it? You can also do D seven. So you go three, six, two, five. And then for the two, I did F, I did, sorry, F sharp nine or G flat nine for like a, a substitute for the two chord. And then I went to F nine. Okay, so I'm get this chromatic line going, and then I'm here. I would go. Okay, now, so how does that work for soloing strategies? Well, after I do it with chords, I then try to um, arpeggiate down from these. Uh, so here's another one. I'm gonna start on D. I'm gonna go up chromatically on rhythm changes. So it's gonna be like this. Okay, and then down now. 
All right. Now I'm going to solo off of that. Okay. So um, listen for the second string or watch the second string. I'm going to really try um, to, to um, get that uh, on, on the instrument and, and, and not um, mess, mess up. <laughs> Wish me luck. So we go like one, two, three, four. <laughs> So there was, I'm, I'm just playing arpeggios down off of those notes. Okay. So that's my favorite soloing strategy. Another one would just be simply to um, uh, target uh, goal tones, uh, guide, guide tones, uh, goal notes, let's say target notes. Okay. So that would be the third of every chord. Go through uh, rhythm changes, for instance, and play the third of every chord. Go. this okay sounds a little funny right so um but it's important to be able to do that um now you can do an approach note pattern to each one i'll use enclosures i'll go you know joe pass would do that a lot that's nothing new of course um i mean maybe to some of you it's it's new but i would check out um you know uh enclosures upper and lower neighbor tones target tone and targeting the third is probably your best bet so that's for soloing strategies those those are some of the the, the big ones for me okay so now i'm going to go to some live questions here um martin asks any advice on singing along to solos if you hate your singing voice okay this is good this is like a, a follow-up question if you hate your singing voice um well do it where nobody can hear you is is one one bit of advice you know um and uh, and just don't be so hard on yourself, you know, um, as far as what your singing voice sounds like. I don't have a great singing voice. Um, that's why I'm not a singer, but that's why I have an instrument or a utensil, as Pat Martino calls them. Um, so this is this is your um, you know instrument here. And, um, you know, but, but I think that you have to get your voice together a little bit. Maybe take some vocal lessons, too. That would that would be good. You might hate your singing voice a little less. Um, if you can figure out some better breathing techniques and things like that. Um, I definitely see a direct connection to people who um, are having trouble soloing and have and are having trouble singing. There's there's something that that goes together there. So um, definitely take it seriously. I think that's that's more important than playing the instrument. If you go back to um, the old Italian form of um, music education, it would be solfege before anything, you know, learning the syllables, sight singing, you know, singing to um, sheet music before you even are allowed to play the instrument. You, you get your, your voice and your ear together. Then you pick up the instrument. You can actually do something with it. Like um, Eddie Lang, um, he learned that way. And, you know, he, he was amazing. George Van Epps idolized him, you know, um, for good reason, too. So anyways, that's that's what I would have to say about that. Sorry if, I, if I'm going kind of quickly because I want to try to answer some more questions here. Um, let's see. Um, some comments and some questions. I, I'm going more for the questions here. Um, okay. Do, 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 do. Sorry about the lull here. Um, Okay, Jay asks, in general, do you think there is more value in spending a ton of time learning and digging into one tune or spreading your time out across learning the essentials of a lot of tunes? Hmm. Yeah, that's a tough question, Jay. Jay. Um, I am one of the guys uh, that is sort of like Bill Evans. I, I share his opinion on this, that in Monk was the same way, Thelonious Monk take one tune and just play it a lot, you know, because these tunes are all very similar. So, um, but, but, you know, if you're jumping around from tune to tune, you're truly not really learning any one particular tune very well. So I would say it's very important to learn one tune really well, because when you, when you perform with people, sometimes they do them in different keys. Um, uh, and that was asked by um, Steve A asked this question. And it's not Steve Abshire, my, my friend Steve Abshire. It's a different Steve A. 
you know who you are, Steve. Um, he asks, um, if you're accompanying a vocalist for the first time and uh, she's named the song, but has not furnished you with any sort of chart, it's a fairly complex but common jazz tune. Uh, it's done almost every time in a particular key. She shows up and informs you that her preferred key is four semitones below the usual. Um, so you just don't move your fingers down. You know, you'll run out of guitar, right? Like Joe Pass sometimes would say, hey, you know, you're playing, you're playing, you run out of guitar. What do you do? Um, you have two minutes. Um, basically, you have maybe paper. What do you do? Well, you know, one thing that uh, people do commonly I'm not so sure I agree with it is, is always um, use the I real book, the phone book, as we like to call it. They, 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 you know, instantly go to the phone book, transpose it, boom, you know, like that. I would say if you have two minutes, let's say um, vocalists ask you this question two minutes before you're going to start a set or something. Okay. Um, and, and let's say, you know, the tune, you know, Steve mentions it's a common jazz tune. You, you know it. So the first thing I would do is I would think of the chord functions of the tune, okay? So I would say, okay, what happens at the, you know, and what happens at certain points? What happens at the bridge? Oh, it's it starts on the four chord at the bridge like so many tunes do, or it does a two five into the four chord. Um, then it goes to four minor and then it goes to one and then it goes maybe up to flat three minor seven, you know? So you analyze it like that using the Roman numerals. If you're having trouble with that, um, maybe just thinking of root motion think, um, you know, uh, I was just teaching this to a student today. We were talking about transposing Green Dolphin Street and, um, you know, the part that goes, um, you know, you know, this, this part, like at the end, it goes, yeah, now that, that's a tough, um, that was, um, a weird key that I was doing. That's in G flat. I'm doing that in G flat, right? So, um, now listen to this root motion. It goes. very logical it goes um, it's a, it's its own melody so every tune has two melodies it has the the actual melody with the lyrics usually um and then it's got the bass line as a melody so that that last part of the tune where it's going okay the bass line goes a flat g flat and we're we're, we're in the key of uh um in the key of G flat. <laughs> I had to think about that for a second. Okay. So I'm not really thinking technically so much here. I'm thinking root motion. I'm going, I'm going, the bass line goes down a whole step, then another step, half step, then it goes cycle four, then cycle four, and then half, um, whole step, sorry, step wise, and then cycle four, cycle four, cycle four. That to me is very logical. So you sing that da di di da di da di da di da 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 da. It's a low. It's out of my range, but anyways, you you get the picture. You have to be able to sing that. You don't have to have a good singing voice. I don't have a good singing voice, but you know, just get close to the notes and be committed to singing them. So that's what I would say there, Steve. I I um would take a second to really think about what the tune does at certain places, especially I, I, if I know the tune has a tricky part, you know, like a key change, maybe some tunes, um, like let's say you're in the key of C and it goes up to the key of E flat and then it goes up to the key of G or it goes to the key of C, E and G. Usually it, it outlines a triad. A lot of those standards, you know, if you're in the key of C, mm -hmm. it'll go to the key of E or it'll go to the key of E flat or it'll go to the key of G or G flat or something like that. Those, those are very popular key centers. So you could, you could think about the tune in the original key, say, oh, okay, um, it modulates up a minor third, and then it modulates to a key up a major third. You know, and so you have that in your mind. And um, 
okay, but if you can't do that, then go ahead and use the phone book, but just don't try, you know, the, the this, you know, <laughs> um, d- don't uh, get into a habit of it. I, I would say, um, you know, try to use it as little as possible. So yeah, that's a good question. Um, another question um, that came in a few days ago um, was, I saw you're here, David, David T from Southern Maryland. Uh, let me find your question here. Um, um, okay, got it. Um, he would appreciate any insights I might have about a systematic way to learn how to solo using triad pairs. And um, the tune that David uh, was asking me about uh, in particular was pent up house. Um, so using triad pairs, um, I have um, two classes for Mike's master classes on triad pairs. They're contrapuntal triad pairs. So they, they're, it goes one step beyond just regular triad pairs. Okay. So, so here's what the thing is um, in a pen up house is in the key of G and it starts like two, five, one, right. So it's going, the solo section is a minor seven, D seven, G usually E seven. And then same thing, D seven, G. Okay. There's that part. Now, as far as triad pairs over that A minor seven, when you play an A minor seven chord in fifth position at the fifth fret here, you've got a C triad, okay? And then um, what I think of is just, I just go up a whole step and I get the triad up a whole step. That is the four and five chord of G major. Um, So you're thinking of A Dorian scale here, probably, right? Or B bop Dorian um, or D bop dominant. It's all the same scale. It would be what I'm doing there is I'm starting from D and the half steps are, uh, there's going to be three half, four half steps in a row, you know? So I'm going basically a minor 11 and then I'm playing the major third then the minor third and then the ninth. And then it's just the, the rest of it is just a Dorian scale. So you just have um, um, a chromatic um, like uh, passing tone one chromatic passing tone it's just the, the major third right okay so anyways back to triad pair so i play the c major i think of the c c major which is part of the a minor seven and then i just think of the chord up a whole step which is which is the d triad okay now in my contrapuntal triad pairs classes now what you're asking about david but uh i'm plugging one of my classes real quick uh is that you're going to take um the triad and you're going to create some movement within the triads. You're going to, and you might go. So there's an inner line. So basically, you use the Van Epps uh, approach, which is on the fifth fret here, my C. I'm going to do the soprano voice super. So I'm going E to F sharp. He calls that super. It's a suspension. Then you go the other way. You go sub. You take the E down to the D. So you go. Now I'm going to do the middle voice super. C going up to D, 7th fret. Then I take C going down to B, 4th fret. Then I take the lower voice, the G goes up to A, super. And the G goes down to F sharp, sub. Okay. Then I go up to D and I just do the same thing. And I think of of the scale, um, the A Dorian scale or the D um, mixolydian. It's the same thing. So I go... I know it may not be that musical. This is an exercise, okay? But it's it's. I tell you, this is a phenomenal exercise. This is this is one of the cornerstones of the George Van Epps techniques, by the way. All right, so your triad pairs are C and D, okay? Um, and now that's really not good for the D seven. I don't like that sound for the D seven. I'm not going to use that sound. So which triad pairs do I use for the D seven? Well, I go to the A. Um, I, I'm sorry, the E flat melodic minor scale which is a half step above the root of the dominant. So over D7, I'm thinking E flat melodic minor. I take the four and five chords of that. Um, what's the four and five chord of E flat melodic minor? It's A flat major and B flat major. Okay, so here's here's my comp. I'm just going to comp over plant up house. I'm going to go. And then I'm going to play the triad pairs over the D7. I get I get my um, altered sound. So I go. 
know what class I use this a lot in, in my altered sounds, uh, my altered states classes. Some people joke about it. Altered sounds. Um, I definitely have that, a lot of that uh, going on. Ooh, let's see. Um, my jazz line construction class also has that. My rhythm changes class also um, has a lot of um, uh, the altered scale, um, which is what this is coming from. Um, and somebody asked a question about the altered scale. We might get to that. This actually answers it a little bit. Um, also, okay, so the triad pairs now, again, I'll pen up how. So I've got, then I've got my one. Five. Now oh, I'm on the, on the E7. I can use triad pairs over the E7. I could use C major and B flat major because I'm, that's coming from F melodic minor. Okay. Um, there's a shortcut to this, by the way. Um, whatever chord you are approaching, use the flat two of that chord and then use the flat three of it. So if I'm playing E7 to A minor, Instead of thinking, oh, let me let me go to F melodic minor. What's the four and five chords of F melodic minor? That's really cumbersome, right? The quickest way to this information would be to say, I'm going E7 flat nine to A minor seven. How do I get the, the correct triad pair? Well, my destination chord is A minor seven. I use B flat major. It's a half step above the root of A minor. There's A minor. There's B flat, so that's the flat two. I just think of flamenco music, like, right? That's A minor, that's B flat C. That's all I'm thinking about. Uh, another person asked a question about Ed Vickert's comping uh, or Jim Hall's comping. Uh, he uses that approach. Both of those guys use that approach a lot on dominant chords is to go like, um, you've heard Wes do that a lot too. To, to minor and then and then over the d7 i would go and then g okay so you can tell and and again if g is my target i want to use a flat which is the flat two and i want to use b flat which is the flat three so i'm going to go and then to g okay so that's a great question um david um there's more to the tune but the um just due to time I, I would say um you know that that approach i would use for all the other chords too when it goes d minor seven to g7 i would use over uh, the d minor um i would use the four and five of that i would use the f and g chords over the d minor seven that would be my my triad pairs f and g and over the g7 i tend to use um d flat and e flat over the g7 get that sound it's a great sound isn't it okay so now now another live question I'm, I'm, I'm working as fast as i can i really appreciate you guys tuning in by the way this is great um i love this idea and i'm really looking forward to doing the next one um okay um so jeff says paul ballenbeck teaches a very similar exercise for chromatic lines through chord changes yeah i'm not surprised um you know Paul is a, is, a, is a hero of mine. I used to listen to Paul in, in D.C. Um, you know, before I, I, I was too scared to even play at jam sessions. I would go to jam sessions and listen to him play. Uh, guy's great. Um, he um, I would say that that any any good player is aware of this concept because it's 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 voice leading. It's, it's at the heart of, of voice leading and good voice leading. It will help your copying and your soloing, your composing. Um, you know, it's it's the most important thing, really, um, is is chords and understanding how to move from chord to chord. So that doesn't surprise me at all, Jeff. Um, let's see some other questions here. Um, exercise guy. Hey, guy again. Um, exercises for locating your solos in the tune without getting lost, locating your solos in the tune. I'm not sure if you can guy, if you can type in something more specific, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about what, what you're getting at there. Um, uh, Larry asked me if I was a fan or if I'm a fan of Kenny pool. Oh yeah. Big time. Love Kenny pool. Um, I first heard the name Kenny pool on a George Van Epps, um, uh, live date 
um, that thing he did in Rochester, I, I believe it was, where he uh, thanked him for, you know, his amp or something, you know. I want to thank Kenny Poole for his hospitality and providing the amp. Anyways, I met Kenny at the Long Island Guitar Show um, many years ago, and um, I, um, I, th I thought it was funny that he was carrying a hard shell case. I hadn't seen many guys carry a guitar in an actual case. You know, everybody has a gig bag. But um, that's, at that point, I wasn't doing much traveling, so I didn't understand. Could have been a flight case for all I know that he came in on, uh, came in with. But um, yeah, Kenny, Kenny was great. Um, he really um, had the George Van Epps thing down to a T um, with a standard six string guitar with a low tuning, maybe tuned down a half step, whole step, maybe a minor third. Uh, Ted Green also liked to, to do that. Um, and I had the pleasure of um, taking a couple lessons off of Ted and, um, you know, huge, huge influence um, on me and so many of you guys I know. And, um, you know, he had guitars all around his apartment and, you know, I picked up a couple of them and played them and, and they were all, all detuned, you know, they were tuned down low. And a big thrill for me was having Ted uh, ask me to uh, play my seven string. At the time I had a solid body seven string. It was the first one that I had. It was, it was a brand called KT and he picked that up and um, it was kind of funny. Uh, I had a, um, an A-frame hardwired onto the bottom of the guitar because the suction cups, you know, they have two suction cups. I, they couldn't stick on this thin, you know, the guitar was half the thickness of this one. So I only had one suction cup and it was real flimsy. So I ended up taking shoelaces and I rigged this thing together and, and, uh, and I was about to take it off for Ted and Ted, no, 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 just leave it. I want to try it this way. And, you know, and, um, yeah, it was a real memorable thing for a uh, day for me, two days, um, back in 96 when I studied with him. Um, and you can see some of the, um, second lesson I took with him on YouTube where he, he does the Baroque stuff, um, uh, just blows your mind, you know, plays the most amazing Baroque. I know most of you guys have seen that. So, um, but if, if not, you've got to check it out, um, go to YouTube and put in Baroque and Ted Green and, and you'll see it. Um, uh, David asks, uh, what's the next step from studying licks to really improvise? Uh, I guess he means really being able to improvise studying licks. Yeah, you know, you can string together licks, um, one lick into the next and everything. Um, but I think that the best thing is I'm going to go back to, to my comment earlier about singing. I think, um, I think if you sang these things, you would be playing things that were more motivic than if you were just stringing together licks. So one of the things that I do with my private students sometimes is I just did this um, the other day with a student. I um, had them working through a tune. Let's pick a tune. Um, how about um, somebody suggested um, How High the Moon. I think yeah, that's that would be a good one, good one to do. <clears throat> yeah, let's try How High the Moon. Okay, so you're going to come up with a lick, and so I give them a lick, and sometimes it's it's a um, it's like a uh, a cliche. You've heard this um, little phrase. I, I I think that you guys should all learn the jazz cliches because they're just so great. You know, this one. You know that little phrase. You've heard that. I don't really know what that is even. So I bent it. I took the phrase over the G. I went, um, I'm on the 12th fret here. Now it goes to G minor. So I'm going to go. So I might go. I have to go to the B flat. I can't go. I have to go. That sounds like a Charlie Christian lick. Now I could then go. Right. But. Maybe you want to take the listener in a different direction. So let me play. I'm going to go. And then I go. You know, so I'm going. So um, it's like the tune exactly like you. And then you can change it. And I'm leaving these little breaths and stuff. So, so I, I, 
I'm trying to um, hear my way through the solo and, and think of the appropriate thing to play instead of just stringing together licks. I, I think, um, again, like um, take an existing melody as your basis, um, as your springboard, okay? Um, I'll, I'll give you another lick. Um, you've heard Robin's Nest, like... Uh, <laughs> I, now I'm going to play it again, but it's over the G minor mm -hmm. and I'm going to change it. So I can do that in several different ways. You, you take a lick like um, this tune, Robin's Nest by Illinois Jaquette. Now I just move the lick up to a place that I know it's going to work. Now, getting back to what I said before, I'm thinking of a chord shape. I'm thinking of this chord. Okay. So, um, or I can stay in the same position and just change the notes I need to change. That's G major. I'm gonna go. Instead of. If I was gonna do it up higher, I could go. That, that, that's a bit of a stretch, but that would be over G minor. I don't have a third in there. But that's okay because I got a, a seventh, ninth, eleventh, uh, and a sixth or a thirteen over the G minor. So I am aware of the notes that I'm playing, the colors, um, and then I'm playing them in a region of the guitar, um, uh, you know, that I have a chord. I'm thinking of the chord in that region. So that that's um, you know something that I like to do there. Um, okay, so uh, we're about all out of time. So I'm just going to try to quickly answer a few more. Um, let's see. Um, Tony asks, any suggestions for a practice regimen for an intermediate player given about an hour of available time? Well, that's a tough one. Um, yeah, you don't have a lot of time. Well, I would say, um, you know, I'm going to go to the first thing again is I would work on ear training first and I would, I would probably split that. Um, I'm, I'm going to give the Howard Roberts answer here. I would split that hour into small time frames, short time frames, um, as um, Pat Carmody would uh, attest to this. That 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 was his, uh, you know, Howard's thing was sp splitting it into um, sections of very very focused practicing. So I would practice. Um, I, I would start with the things that are most important, like ear training and sight reading. Um, you know, if 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 you're not interested in sight reading or whatever. Um, then you can skip that. But I, th I think it's a good thing for a guitar player. You know, Herb Ellis used to say, do the stuff that's, um, that requires the most attention at first, you know, like, uh, in other words, save the soloing till the end of your practice session. Um, yeah. You know, that's the payoff. That's the fun part. So I would say work on soloing last. I might work on um, maybe split the hour into 10 minute uh, segments, right? And uh, so... You know, for 10 minutes, you would be working on, um, uh, you know, ear training, 10 minutes of sight reading, 10 minutes learning tunes, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I think the best answer to this, actually, because I did a whole master class on this is um, practicing. And I, I'll tell you the name of the class exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, fundamentals checkpoint. Oh yeah. Practicing and memorizing tunes, a systematic approach for all levels. So I would say to, to fully answer the question about, um, that I basically have a list of levels and it, it's based off of a, um, four year college program. Um, and it breaks it up into semesters like, you know, and it's all tune based approaches. Um, there's a lot of stuff on that list. And obviously, you know, your practicing is going to change from time to time. You're not always going to be working on the same things all the time. Um, but, you know, you go down the list and you, uh, you know, you stick with a certain um, bunch of exercises until you feel like you've, you've truly, um, are, you're truly ready to move on to something else. Okay. So I, I'm sorry to, to, you know, not really spend that much time on that question, but I did a whole class on it. So that's, that's probably the best I can do. Um, okay. So, um, 
I know we're getting towards the end here. Um, maybe I'll just answer one more question here. Um, okay. Um, maybe I should probably go back to one of these um, questions that somebody sent in advance um, just because they were so organized. <laughs> and I haven't gotten to, to these in a while. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Okay. This is a good way to end it probably is because I've got I've had this question many times about um, how do you how do you hold the guitar the way you do? Sorry if I'm boring you guys. I'll I'll be quick with this. Is it just a, <laughs> that's me, not the question? Is it just a strap or some other support? No, it's just a strap. Okay, so so my my answer to that would be get a light guitar if if you can afford to get a light guitar, get a light guitar because it's very uh, minimal um, pressure on your shoulder. And I have tried wide straps. This is a very narrow strap. I've tried wide straps, but honestly, this is the best one that works for me. And it doesn't really give me any trouble. So, you know, it's not even really padded, but, um, you know, you could get a padded one and a wide one. It doesn't matter. Um, I have the strap button mounted here on, on, on my guitar. It's about halfway. Um, I'll take it off so you can see. Um, so I have the strap button mounted there and there's two cool things about this. One is I can get the guitar in the, in my cello position, uh, fairly easily. And the other is I can take a flat pick, um, and I can rest it right here and it stays. Sometimes I even put, put it in the case like this. See the kit, it, it sort of sticks a little bit underneath there, maybe against the body. I'll just drop it. But, uh, anyway, sometimes it'll stay on there really well. Um, and, um, yeah. And then when I need a pick, I just grab it. It's just up there. Okay. But um, getting back to the question about holding the guitar, um, I, it goes against my leg um, in a way. Um, so all the pressure is not on my shoulder. Um, it's, it's resting on my right leg. I'll back up a little bit. So, so it's like resting here on my right leg. So I feel like I'm distributing the guitar and it's also resting on my left leg. Um, this part is, is, is uh, resting on, on my left leg. So I don't think that the, all the weight is on my shoulder. Okay. And, and look, I can take my hands and, and the guitar just stays in this position. So it's kind of nice, you know, I, I, that's, and that's one of the reasons why I have the neck up so high, because if I had it down here, it tends to move around a lot. Um, this has been great for my left hand and, um, you know, keeping a straight wrist like Bill Levitt, uh, my teacher at Berkeley, who wrote all the, the Berkeley series guitar books. Great teacher, great guy. Um, he was always talking about keeping a straight wrist. And back when I studied with Bill, I, I held my guitar like this and I played with a pick, you know. Um, so it was a totally different uh, thing. And he was always saying like, hey, look how this shoulder is going down, this shoulder is going up. I met Barney Kessel uh, one time and he was almost frozen in this position like this, you know, like he, his, he just wasn't standing. So his shoulders were straight. It's because he had played so many years with, with this um, shoulder up higher than the other one. And I looked at that and I said, geez, I, I have to figure out another way. So I started using a, cl a classical footstool. Um, and then that started becoming a little uncomfortable for my lower back. So I kind of gravitated into, um, you know, using the strap and everything. So that's about it. Okay, well, geez, I, I really um, want to thank all you guys uh, for uh, attending the grand opening of Mike's Master Classes and the webinar here. It's been a real pleasure. And um, I have, I know I've got more questions. So, you know what, just feel free to email me or, um, you know, um, send me a question on Facebook and I'll, I'll do my best uh, that I can to answer it or, you know, save it for the next one. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, Mike's going to have me back um, at some point to do another one of these. Um, and um, so uh, I want to just um, let you all know that stick around. Don't leave yet. Stick around because um, there's going uh, in a few minutes. Um, Mike is going to offer a 24 hour discount code um, for three of my classes and you can get them at a substantial savings. Really, it's a great deal. So, um, and, oh, and also, you know, now we have rentals and streaming, uh, on the website. It's a brand new website. Um, and we're going to be having these webinars. There's a whole bunch. So check out the webinar schedule. And, um, I want to thank you very much. Um, I feel like playing more, but I, I know I got to get going. So, um, mm -hmm. I will just leave you with, um, 
you know, uh, take care and hope to see you soon. Bye now. Hello there. First of all, I want to thank Steve Herberman for this live Q&A session today. In the real world, I would say let's give him a big hand or round of applause. But in the online world, the way you show appreciation is by using the like button. So if you haven't done so already and you're on YouTube, go ahead and click that like button down on the bottom. We would truly appreciate it. And if you are attending via the webinar system, don't worry, uh, you'll be receiving an email at the end of the program, at the end of the show, with uh, other show notes um, that will include the link to YouTube and you can just do it at that time. And in just a few moments, I will be sharing today's 24-hour discount code. Many years ago, we performed live sessions with the masters, and in a sense, today's session is sort of bringing us back to our roots. So if you liked this type of live session, be sure to let us know, again, by either liking or leaving a comment. We'd really appreciate the feedback. That way we can know if this is something that students benefit from moving forward. These live sessions are so unique in that we are connecting from vast areas of the world. Steve is in New York, Mike is in Arizona, and I am in California. And on the last live session, we had Tom Lippincott in Florida. Also in that session, we had visitors attending from all over the world, including Bangkok, Portugal, Canada, UK, Brazil, and many other US states. If you haven't done so already, please take a moment to share with everybody where you're attending from. Here at Mike's Masterclasses, we are working to enhance the way you learn jazz guitar and jazz bass online. If you are serious about taking your skills to the next level, what we offer here may have some good options for you. One student has stated, my playing was so enriched because I had exposure to so many points of view from so many masters of the instrument. Honestly, I live for each new class. I still go back and retake these lessons and learn new things as I mature in this art form. Thanks so much. Brendan also stated, I have found it great to have the opportunity to tap into the brains of the masters no matter where you are in the world. Andrew says, these classes really changed my plane. There is a wealth of knowledge in each class that has kept me busy for years. If you are attending and you're new to MMC, a good place to start might be in the bundles area where we have created basic, intermediate, and advanced bundles. If you're more serious about your learning this year, we also offer affordable membership options for under $30 a month. This includes access to all the live sessions like this one, all the previously recorded live Q&A sessions, and one full class each month of your choice from over 250 of our in-depth classes. And yes, we still offer downloading of all of our classes to take it with you wherever you like. Today's session is just the beginning of our planned series throughout the year. You can see our upcoming months are already starting to fill up with our live Q&A sessions. And if this is something that you're benefiting from, be sure to inquire more at mikesmasterclasses.com. Just a quick disclaimer about Cheryl's Facebook Live session that is still pending some confirmation, so that's just hopeful right now. Uh, but we urge you to go on over to Facebook and like the Mike's Master Classes page because hoping that that does occur, it will occur on that Facebook Live page. Once again, I want to say thank you to all of those who've been hanging out with us today and a thank you to Steve Herberman and Mike Geller. Today's discount code, as promised, is 125STEVE and that will give you 25% off 
of any of the following classes listed here. That's 25% off of pedal points part four, upper, upper pedals, or fun with tenths, or Steve's classic going for Baroque. Steve has personally recommended going for Baroque if you happen to be new to his classes. For any of you that might be looking for one more free session, we are offering the possibility to watch Tom Lippincott's live Q&A session we recorded from last week. You can simply go to mikesclass.es slash tomlrp and you can set yourself up to see a replay of Tom's live Q&A session from January 15. Thanks again for your time, and we look forward to seeing you on the next session. Take care.